Hi, this is Miss Slitton, and this is seventh period. And where are you? Um, uh, <laughs> say hi. hi. All right. So chapter 27, <laughs> quiz manana. So let's get to the nitty gritty parts of it. And the first, wait, where am I? Where am I? So the first thing for, it stopped. Okay, it was here. <laughs> All right. So evidence of evolution. So you want to have these pieces of evidence down. So let's just briefly run through those. So the first one was fossil evidence. To be a fossil, you have to be? 10,000. And do you have to be the actual thing itself? No. No, you could be a? Cat. Uh, <laughs> I'm leaving footprints and imprints, right, of a cat. <laughs> um, yeah, so you're, sorry. And pick you up, we're tired. <laughs> Just keep going through here. Fossil. Okay, 10,000. We looked at different ones. Ice might hold something like a woolly mammoth, right? But amber might hold a bug. There's amber, huh? And amber might hold a bug. You could be a petrified wood. Exactly. We talked about molds and casts. Um, you, a mold would be like an outline of something. A cast fills the mold and hardens. Um, we talked about imprints. We talked about sedimentary rock. Um, then we went into um, that the characteristics of the fossil record is that you can see change over time. And sometimes you can see a lot of transitional fossils in that. We looked at the horse evolution, um, where this would be a form of what kind of selection? Wait, did I teach you this part? Directional selection? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we talked about it. Um, I'll, I'll review it with you. Okay, where the horse kept getting larger and larger. Um, we looked at examples of um, fo uh, transitional fossils would be like the Archaeopteryx, which um, is like a transition between a reptile and a bird. Later, at the end of the chapter, we talked about um, timing of it. Remember, we talked about phyletic gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium. Which one is fast, gradualism or punctuated equilibrium? Punctuated, punctuated equilibrium, where you have fewer transitional fossils. Gradualism, you see a lot of transitions in between. Um, we talked about two types of dating. Um, and Relative dating, it's the relative order. You're just assuming that the rocks on top are what, newer or older? Mm. Newer, and the lower layers are older. older. Um, and we talked about absolute dating, where you're doing a carbon dating, which we learned last year. I know because I had some of it in class. And we talked about half-lives. And we know how fast isotopes break down. Um, we... We talked about the different eras. Why don't we review the eras? Because you know I'm going to have some question on the eras. Okay. So the era that we are in right this second is what? The Cenozoic era. And the Cenozoic era goes back how many millions of years? 65 million years. And how do we remember that? Speed limit. 65 million years ago. Then before the Cenozoic era, the one in the middle would be the Mesozoic era. And it, go, it ended 65 million years ago, but it started when? 248. 248, somewhere in there, right? And how do we remember that? School. School's out. And then the old and Paleozoic ended at 248, but it started what? 542 million. And then everything before that you call what? Precambrian. And everything before that started about how long ago? 4.6 Yeah, 4.6 billion years ago when the Earth formed, then about a billion years later, about 3.5 billion years, we had life. Yeah, first cell. Good, good. Um, <laughs> by the end of the Precambrian, right, when we're transitioning from Precambrian into Paleozoic, what do we have to start out with plant-wise? Algae. So from algae, you'll have like moss and ferns and larger plants. And then at the end of the Paleozoic, you have the beginnings, beginnings of gymnosperms, okay? Animal-wise, we have, Christmas tree's not a question, right? Um, Animal-wise, we have what? 
not vertebrates, but invertebrates, invertebrates right? And you're going to have, what am I? Oh, fish. I'm a fish. <laughs> and then, and amphibian, and then, at, by early reptiles at the end. Okay, so it's not full on reptiles, but you have your early reptiles at the end of Paleozoic, right? So now we're at Mesozoic. We start with early reptiles, but we end with early mammals. We start with early gymnosperms, but we begin with early angiosperms. Cenozoic, we start with early angiosperms, and we end with herbs. And then um, animal-wise, we start with early mammals, and we end with humans. Okay. So just keep in mind, so if I ask you a question to identify the era that you can, because chances are, I'm going to ask you that. Chances are great, because I've already written the quiz. All right. So then, we did all that, we did all that, we did all that. Then we looked at um, biogeographical evidence. That you see certain organisms living where the environment is one they could handle, right? And where they could compete. And you see change of organisms over time based on the continents and where they were located. You can look at fossils. We have evidence that the continents were all together at one point. Um, plate tectonics would tell us that those continents moved and shifted. And at one time, we had a supercontinent called Pangaea. And you can see like fossilized ferns on all of them in one ring right in one area. Um, we then went on to talk about anatomical evidence. And, and there were three pieces of anatomical evidence. See if you can remember all three in your head. Don't say them out loud. Just see if you can remember. Put them in um, alphabetical order. What one would you say first? Embryological. embryological, yeah. And so in embryological, you compare embryos, right? And the more similar the embryos are, to each other, the more likely they have a common ancestor. Also, you can look at embryos and it's kind of like evolution on fast forward. Yeah, fast forward. What would be the next one I would say? Homologous, Homologous structures. So you can see humerus, radius, solana, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges, and you can see it whether it's a human, a horse, a cat, a whale, a bird, or a bat. And so you're saying they probably have a common ancestor that they developed from. They don't all use it for the same function. Now, a bat and a bird happen to have the same function with their forearm. What do they use it for? But so does a butterfly, right? So just having a wing for flight, that, that would just be a what kind of structure? Analogous. And that is not evidence for evolution. That's just saying we deal with our environment in the same <coughs> way. That's an example of what's called convergent evolution. We converged on the same solution. The solution was, let's fly. Another one might say, let's what? Swim. And another one might say, let's walk, okay? Those are analogous structures when it's same function. But if it's the same structure, that's more important, okay? That is a piece of evidence, okay? And what would be the last one? Vestigial. And this points to our what? Past, where we came from, our evolutionary history. We know that this salamander with its withered eye probably came from a line of salamanders that had eyes that lived in the light, but as he migrated in into the dark of a cave, those eyes did not become necessary, and so he lost their ability. Okay, these are not things we use now, like kidneys and hearts. Okay, those are important now. We're talking about ostrich wings and penguin wings, right, because they use them for different structures. So that would be a vestigial structure, pointing to our ancestral past. And then we looked at biochemical evidence, which is you're comparing DNA or you're comparing proteins that DNA codes for, and you're saying the more similar our DNA, the more likely we are related. And from that, we looked at things like cladograms. And we said, okay, this is an ancestral trait we all have. And from here on up, um, this hagfish doesn't have jaws, but everybody else does. Um, the perch doesn't have lungs, but everybody else does from that, from that um, line forward. And that is a cladogram. And you could do it with structure, or you could do it with sequencing of amino acids in a protein, and you did a protal on that. Okay, questions on that? 
Okay, we talked about microevolution, we talked about macroevolution. Microevolution is within a species, and industrial melanism was a good example of that. Because whatever color moth that you saw the most frequent depended on whether there was pollutants on the tree or not. So pre-industrial revolution, um, the light colored moths, you had more of those because they would not be seen. Post-industrial revolution, you had more dark colored moths. And then after things got cleaned up, you went back to the original, more like this. So that would, still the same species. It's just like blonde hair and brown hair, which one became more frequent. Um, and this um, yellow belly three-toed skink, starting to keep its, its young within, and it still mates with those that lay the eggs, so it hasn't macro evolved yet, but enough changes occur, enough microevolution can lead to a macroevolution. And that led us to the five fingers of evolution, things that can cause change in our allele frequencies. So what are some things that can cause change? What was this one? Pinky was a small population, because they're more susceptible to genetic no, I don't know where I'm going. I'm in a boat. I'm just genetic drift. Remember genetic drift? Small populations are more susceptible to genetic drift. What were the two types of drift? What is it when a disaster happens? We're going through a bottleneck, right? A disaster. Somebody's choking me. Bottleneck. <laughs> disaster okay and so only a few make it through what was the second one founders, founders effect. effect we established a new colony it wasn't representative of all the alleles in the original colony okay so if small populations are more susceptible <coughs> to genetic drift then if you want to prevent evolution don't have a small have a large so you want to know the counter argument since it's hard to always have a large population probably you're going to evolve what was the next one? Non-random mating. Non mating, saying this one is better than that one. They have adaptations I like, I wanna mate with them. So if you wanna prevent evolution, then you need to have what kind of mating? Random, Random mating, okay? Again, hard to keep, so probably you're gonna have evolution. What was the third one? Mutations. mutations. Changes to the DNA. It's hard to prevent that, no mutations, <laughs> so probably evolution's gonna occur. What was the pointer finger? gene flow. New genes coming in, other ones leaving. You cannot control usually who comes into your population, so again, you're going to get new alleles, you're probably going to have evolution. <coughs> what was the thumb? Adaptation. Adaptation. So some traits are going to be more adapted to others. Since you can't, since those things happen, those five fingers, you cannot prevent evolution from occurring. <coughs> so we looked at allele frequencies, and we said for any well, we simplified it. We said if you weren't tall, then you were what? Short. So there are two alleles. There's the tall allele and there's the short allele. Which trait did we say was dominant? Tall. So we're gonna say that's the P percentage and short would be the Q. Mind your P's and Q's. They're in, <laughs> they're in your gene pool. So um, it, you might be, if you're not round, you might be a wrinkled pea. If you're not yellow, you might be green. This is assuming there's only two choices. And there are more than two choices for a lot of traits. This is very simple. Okay, so in your gene pool to select from, if I said that there was 60% of the time there was the tall allele, then that means, what do I have left? 0.4. So that's what's in my gene pool. 0.6 and 0.4 for P and Q. So if I pull out a P for tall, right, and I pull out another P for tall, that would be then 0.6 times 0.6, which would be what? Yeah, 0.36 or 36%, I would expect to be tall, tall, where both of their alleles were tall. Now I could do PQ or QP, it's the same thing, so that's why there's two, okay, because it's the same thing. What's 0.6 times 0.4? 0.24 times 2 is, yeah, 48% of the time I would expect to see those that are a carrier for that receptive allele. And then two shorts, that would be 0.4 times 0.4. What is that? 6%. Yes, 
16. So I would expect 16% of the time I would see that short, short allele. So if I give you, hey, out in the population, I see 16% of the population then you, that has that trait, that short trait, where you are a short plant, then what you would have to do is take the square root just to get a single one, right? Because you know it's a Q times Q if they have that recessive trait. So take the square root so you know Q. Once you know Q, take away it from one and you've got P. Then you can do whatever you want, PP, 2PQ. So what if I tell you that 4% uh, of a population is expressing a recessive trait, like short or blue eye? Some recessive trait. Could you calculate for me how many are carriers? I mean, I could ask you a lot of things, but solve for everything. How many are carriers? How many are homozygous for tall or brown eyes? What percentage of the population? What's P, what's Q based on that? What? For um, the recessive trait. And I'm gonna pause you right there while you're doing the math. Okay, so if you get something like this, and I say 4% of the population, then you go, okay, how do I write 4% in decimal form? Okay, some people might wanna go, oh, it's 0.4, That's really <coughs> gonna be what? 40%, so you don't wanna write that, you'd wanna write 0.04. And if it is equal to the recessive trait, what part of the equation is that? Q squared, Q -squared. okay? So now I just need to solve for Q, and Q is gonna be equal to what? 0.2, which is 20%, right? And if Q is equal to 0.2, then P is equal to 0.8. What percentage of the popula population would be then TT, which is tall, that'd be P squared, that'd be what? 64% or 0.64. How many are gonna be heterozygotes, big T, little t, that's 2PQ. So that'd be two times 0.8 times 0.2. 16 times 32 percent or 0.32 and then how many are little t little t or q squared that would be 0.2 times we already know the answer to that which is what four percent or 0.04 okay questions you want to ask me about that one you good okay so basically what we said is if these allele frequencies change, if these allele frequencies change, if this changes to 0.7, and then this would have to change, because if you're not Q, you're P, it would have to be what? If that has occurred, that is called microevolution. What evolution? What could cause microevolution? The five fingers, right? <laughs> Six fingers of dominant. <laughs> five fingers of evolution could cause it to change. And if you get enough, <laughs> it's terrifying. And if you get enough of those microevolutionary changes, then that can lead to what? Macroevolution, which would be a new species. Eight fingers, okay. <laughs> now, um, we did that, we did that, we did that, we did that. We talked about what are adaptations, anything that makes you better suited to the environment. And when we talk about speciation, um, the most common one was allopatric speciation. Some barrier has separated you. A river has separated you. Um, a lava flow has separated you. And so you accrue changes as you're separated from each other. So even if the river drives up or dirt grows over the lava, or it cools down, you have had so many changes that have occurred over time that you do not interbreed anymore. That's the most common form, allopatric speciation. We looked at an authentic examples with, sal with salamanders who are migrating from the north down to Southern California and 
what came between them was the desert. So as they migrated south, they accrued so many changes. There were so many different species as a result of that. Um, sympatric speciation is usually chromosomal. Usually some failure to do, um, have we done mitosis <coughs> and yet? No. Um, some chromosomal anomaly have taken place, and so as a result, you no longer can interbreed. Your DNA, your chromosomes are not the same. That is sympatric speciation. And I gave you this um, diagram to explain. Here on the left, what kind of speciation are we looking at? And here on the right, sympatric. So they're right there. They weren't separated from each other other than by their own chromosomes. And then another one we looked at was adaptive radiation, spreading out to fill all the niches, like resource partitioning. So if you analyze the finches, which came from a common ancestral species, you will see that their beaks are different and their feet are different. And so they're exploiting different resources in that environment. And then the last thing was just the pace of speciation, which we already, oh, and I showed you the honey creepers too. The pace of speciation. It could be slow and gradual or very quick. And by quick, meaning you accrue changes every million years. Which one has more transitional forms? Gradualism. Yeah, gradualism will have a lot of trans. transitional forms in phyletic gravity, because it's happening very slowly. So you can see all the intermediates. When you have punctuated equilibrium that's quick, you don't see as many transitional forms. And then that was the end. Good job, yay! Study, 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 or take a nap, have a piece of toast. Your quiz is gonna be 10 questions. Should we do two points each? Make it tw 20 points, yeah. Big quiz, 10 questions, two points. Yeah, that's right, because I normally do, yeah, duh. Sorry, I'm tired. So you have 10 questions, two points each, 20 points. Don't forget to do your additional objectives, because those will be on there too. Okay, you're super smart. Love you very much.